The question is phrased, what is the point of the Trinity? Let's be clear, Christians did not invent the Trinity for any purpose at all. Christians believe in the Trinity because the scriptures don't give us any choice but to believe in the Trinity. It wasn't invented for a purpose or a point and we don't embrace the Trinity because it's more reasonable than a unipersonal God. No. We believe in the Trinity because the apostolic teaching gives us no choice but to believe in the Trinity. And we believe in the Trinity because the Bible teaches it. If you believe in a unipersonal God, then you don't believe in the God of the Bible. So say you. Any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? Do you, know do you want to debate it? Do you, know what do you want to debate it? Do you know what Come and debate it then. Okay. So, first question I have is what is your take on a person? What's the definition that you stand by? Do you stand by Aquinas' definition or do you stand by another definition? I don't know Aquinas' definition. Wait, well, let me finish. You asked a question, let me answer. You ask me, do I stand by Aquinas' definition? I don't know it, so I can't stand on it. However, in terms of my understanding of the distinction between the persons, it's in connection to their hypostatic property. That the Son is begotten of the Father, and the Spirit is spirated of the Father. In other words, and the Father is uncaused. And so, the three persons of the Trinity, sharing the divine attributes that are linked to the concept of divinity, have hypostatic attributes that are unique and thus we speak of persons, such as their economia in the actions of God. That is, for instance, that God commands that man should be saved, Jesus redeems man through his death and resurrection, and that the Spirit sanctifies. The one act of salvation is not complete until all three persons have performed their various acts. Their various acts form the one action of the divine. It's called the economia. And within that economia, we make distinctions. No problem. I understand that. I've read on the economy of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit and the distinctions between them. But what I'm calling into question, and because you don't know Aquinas' definition, I I'll say it for you. Yep. He believes that a person is a substance with a rational nature. Okay. So this means that, for example, like, what's your name? Bob. Bob. My name is Shane. Bob is in the house! Brother here, we've got three distinct persons, right? But we all share in the same essence, the attributes that make us all human. But we are still three distinct persons. The same way you would posit the Trinity. There's three distinct persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and there's one essence that make them all God. So what I'm actually asking you is how is that not three gods when we have three people here with one essence, like you said, for the, for the Trinity? Right. And that's really what I'm trying to understand. So what I'm saying to you, bro, is that I am not going to defend your statement of what Aquinas believes. I'm going to go away and read what Aquinas says and defend what I know he says, not what you say he says. Okay, now, right. so what I am, again, I'm not going to defend Aquinas' statement. You're talking to me, you're debating me. So how can there be one God and how can there one be three and three be one is essentially the question. Well, there's many examples where one can be three and three can be one. Here's an example. We're standing in three-dimensional space. You have the x-axis, the y-axis, and the z-axis. Each axis has exactly the same attributes, so that if you rotate them, they behave and are exactly the same, despite their rotation. We stand in three-dimensional space, but we experience it as one thing. Here's another example of how three can be one and one can be three the triple point of water, where water under certain pressures and certain temperatures takes on exactly at the same time the attributes of solid gas and liquid at the same moment. These are examples of how three can be one and one can be three. If 
Now, the, the way to understand it is to recognise that you're not counting the same thing twice. When we say God is one, we're talking about God's essence, the thing that makes God, God. When we say God is three, we're counting God's person, the thing that makes, the, the thing that makes each of the persons their person. And this, I've already said that the, def, the, the distinction that I'm going to defend is the distinction of their economy within the action and their, uh, their uh, hypostatic attributes. Right. That's the distinction, the personhood that I'm going to defend. And I don't understand that completely and that's why I'm calling into question that theology. Because you didn't, you, 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 you got Yeah, no, you're right. What you haven't done is you haven't demonstrated logically why that's the case. You keep on telling us it's one God because there's one essence. So guess what, guys? There's one human being. There isn't 20 human beings here. There's one because there's one essence. That's human being. It's humanity. Just like there's one God, it's their essence. That's what makes them all God. But you still have three distinct persons. There's still 20 different people here. So you haven't actually sorted out the logical fallacy you're calling to. When you call into the three different axes that you're talking about, when it comes into the dimensions, guess what? You said that they're identical to each other. That's not three distinct persons that are not each other. That is actually, guess what? You may not know it, you fall into modalism. If you don't fall into modalism, guess what? You fall into tritheism, as I've already demonstrated. Three distinct persons, not each other, not identical, only identical in essence. Look, three distinct persons, me, Shay, Bob, and this brother right here. Three distinct persons, one essence, humanity. So what, there's one human, just like there's one God, one essence, that's God. Make no sense. Can I reply, Shane? Shane, where, where are you coming from spiritually? What's your background? Are you, are you Christian, are you Muslim, or are you? I'm a Christian, I'm a dynamic monarchian. Okay, so let's be clear. Shane confused language. I don't know if you picked up on it. He said that there's one, two, three persons, and then he said there's one human. That was a misuse of language. In terms of the species, we are all one species because we are all human. So we belong to the species humanity. But in terms of our personhood, we're three persons. And Shane confused the language, because I don't know if you picked up on it, I did. He went, we, there's, more, there's three persons, so there's only one human. That's an irrational statement. If there are three persons, there are three humans, but there's only one species, humanity, that is shared by us all. Now, in terms of the divine persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, there is only one species, the species of divinity. And there are three persons that have that species, that possess that species. The Father possesses it, the Son possesses it, and the Holy Spirit possesses it. The best thing you can do, guy, brother, 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 the best thing you can do is ignore the deranged man. Just close ranks, form a shield, and ignore the deranged man. He's feeding on your energy. All right. Now, in terms of species, Father, Son and Holy Spirit only have one species, divinity, and they all have it. But I want to be clear, their possession of it is in a way different from our possession of common humanity. And I want to use a crude analogy, a crude analogy to demonstrate how it is different from how we share in humanity. How the Father, Son and Holy Spirit are one in essence is like saying myself, Shane and this brother all shared in the same atoms, nuons and electrons at the exact same moment in time. In other words, that we were exactly the same material at the same time. Now that Unity is what is taught by Christianity. The analogy is crude, but I hope you understand that how we share in one species is different from how God, the Father, Son and Holy Spirit share in one species. It's actually not. 
you proved my point perfectly. I, I, this is why I was, if you watch this back, I was going, listen to what he's saying. Divinity, humanity, they're synonymous when we deal with terms because they're, the, they're both categories in which being sit in or possess. So guess what? You have three persons that are identified with divinity and you have three humans or three persons that are human beings that exist in humanity. You don't just have one God now or one human being, you have three human beings, you have three gods. This is why I said he was into tritheism or modalism. Now, let's prove it even further. He tried to say that we would have to share in the same atoms. Not true, because that's what substance is there for. When we say there's three distinct substances, we're talking about three distinct persons. This is why we don't have to be the same atoms and we don't have to share the same substance. If I when we deal with um, individuality, so I'll give you, I'll give you three definitions. Definition one, essence. The definition for essence is the attributes that make something or someone what it is. So we're all human. That's the definition of essence. Then we have the definition of substance. The definition of substance is the attributes that make a, a individual or something or someone an individual. So I'm not you. He's not me. You're not me. Guess what? When they say Father, Son, Holy Spirit. They call in to question the second definition, substance, the attributes that make something or someone an individual, not each other, right? Can I reply? That's why the father's not the son, correct? Can I reply? Okay, let me finish off here and I'll let you reply. When we get to essence now, this is what he's calling one God. He, he wants to forget about the three distinctions which makes them three distinct persons, not each other, not each other, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, or not each other. He wants to forget that and then harp on is one God because there's one essence. That's logic, logically not sound. I can say, if we take his example, I can say for humans, oh, we're one human now. We're one human. Do you know why we're one human? Because we all share the same essence. Even though we're different substances, even though we're different substances, different people. That's what he's calling into, that's what I'm calling into question. That's what can I reply? Him. Him. So Shane would do better in this argument if he didn't actually characterize me and actually listen to what I said. Because once again, he's ignored what I said and repeated the same error again. Firstly, I said that the Father, Son and Holy Spirit were one in essence. And I'm happy to work with his definition of essence. It's the thing that makes you what you are. We have attributes that make us human and therefore we all share in the essence of, did I say human? No, humanity. So in other words, humanity is distinct from human. They are linked, one is built on the other. Every human is part of humanity because they have the attributes, but each human is distinct. This is what we are saying about the Father, Son and Holy Spirit, that they all share in the attributes of divinity. They are divine, but they are distinct as Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Shane, for some reason, tried to suggest that I had eliminated the distinction. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I don't know if Shane believes in the Bible. He hasn't said well he believes in terms of scripture, but we can demonstrate that the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit are all God. And so I'm going to ask Shane, firstly, to tell me, please, which of these statements he disagrees with. And for the sake of clarity, I'll ask you one at a time until you tell me that you disagree with one. And then I propose we debate that, okay? Do you believe that there is only one God? Do you believe that the Father is that God? Yes. Do you believe that the Son is that God? Right, so this is what we're now going to debate. Whether the Bible teaches that Jesus is God. Fair? So, you go first. Tell us why Jesus is not God. According to Acts chapter 2, Peter is speaking. If we're going to take anyone from any words from anyone, it should be Peter because he is the head of the church, he's the chief cornerstone. So let's read what he says. 
Acts chapter 2. Let's see if he says he's God, or let's see if he says he's a human being or man. Can I suggest we do one passage at a time? No problem, yeah. No problem. This is Acts chapter 2, verses 22. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst as you yourselves know so God is doing these things through a man not that this man is God according to Peter that's right. Acts 2, tw that's Acts 2 22. okay so he's brought in Acts 2 22 put your hand up if you're a Christian Keep your hand up if G you believe that Jesus was fully man. So in other words, Peter saying that Jesus was a man accords with what we believe. Christians believe that Jesus was fully man. But do we believe that Jesus was only a man? So I agree with Peter in Acts 2, 22, without dispute, the man Jesus performed wonders on behalf of God the Father. But in Titus chapter 2, verses 13, it says this, looking for the blessed hope and the appearance of the glory of our great God and Saviour, Christ Jesus. So my question to Shane is very simple. According to Titus chapter 2 verse 14, who is being called God? I believe in Titus chapter 2 verses 14, the one being called God is the Father because when you read verses 1, it tells you how many... Now let's do the context research. If we go to Titus, and I'm going to read it, chapter 1... Guys, guys, you guys, honestly, trust me, just form a shield and ignore him. He's feeding on the fact that you're giving him attention. I agree. So this is Titus chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. So we can get the quote unquote, I would call in this case, prologue or the main teaching of what is going to be stated in verses 5 on down. Which he says, he, uh, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth which according with, with great godliness. It says, in hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before the ages began, and at the proper time manifested in his word through the preaching, which I have seen have been entrusted by the command of God, our Saviour. Now this is where you've got to listen carefully. To Titus, my true child in a common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus, our Saviour. So when you read the scripture, you have to know who he's calling God and who he's calling the Saviour in the context before you read the rest of the scripture. This is why when you read the next part in verse 14, it says God and Jesus Christ our Saviour. And if you understand what and is used there to demonstrate, is to demonstrate a distinction. It's not saying and this person is God. No, it's saying God is there and the person Jesus is there. That's all it's doing, and we know that because of verses four. Now, uh, I, I wanna ask him about Peter again. Can you show me from Peter's own mouth or his own teaching where he ever calls Jesus God? He ever says Jesus is God? He ever says that you should believe he's God? Go ahead. Right, ladies and gentlemen. I'm gonna answer his question very directly, but I first want to comment on his counter argument and then I want to introduce another passage. So, in answer to his question, and I can find this if he wants to dispute it, but the Greek is clear and indisputable that in Titus, the one being called God and Saviour is, is Jesus Christ. In fact, ladies and gentlemen, Scholars construct a grammatical rule from that very passage about Greek grammar 
that demonstrates that the passage is talking about Jesus Christ. And I'm happy to return to that if he wants to dispute it. But the passage very clearly states our God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And the grammatical rule is that both of those titles are connected to Jesus. Now he asked a fair question. Where does Peter say that Jesus is God? I will show him. I believe it's in 2 Peter. Give me a second to find it, bro. So. Right. In, listen, he asked, where does Peter call God in his own words? In 2 Peter, chapter 1. Simon Peter, a bond servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours by the righteousness of our God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. So there, Peter calls Jesus Christ God. I've answered his question. No. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce another passage. Oh, no, sorry, we said one passage each, and I've introduced 2 Peter, so I'll come back to my next passage. Okay, so again, he's made the same mistake he made with Titus, which is not reading uh, 1 Peter chapter 1. In 1 Peter chapter 1, the writer of every single book will designate who God is, which he done in Titus 1, he designated God in Titus 1, is God the Father. Titus 1 and 1, if anyone wants to go and read it again. Now we're going to do this in the book of Peter. He designates who God is again. He keeps on harping on the fact that he says God and Saviour Jesus Christ. He forgets the word and, and. It's like saying John and Sam. Is John now Sam? No, two distinct people. And is being used there as a distinctive term. So now this is how we're meant to read the Bible. If we go to 1 Peter, now let's go there. 1 Peter chapter 1, let's see who he distinguishes as that God in 2 Peter chapter 1, who is and or with Jesus. This is 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to those who are elect, exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the knowledge of God, the Father, in the sanctification of the spirit for obedience to jesus christ and for sprinkling with his blood may grace and peace be multiplied upon you so what the problem is is when people read the bible they don't understand the relevant context in which the writers are calling this person god and the other person which is and or with because again greek the word is chi in the greek and it's just a conjunction. It's just with and. Uh, so it doesn't mean that this is now the same person, identical, and it's now calling him God. I can show you many places where this happens with human beings. Now, are you going to call Peter Satan? Get behind these Satan? What's Peter Satan now? That'll make no sense. Peter's not Satan. So there's a relevant context on how you have to understand these passages. Go ahead. Okay, let me introduce my passage and then you can go ahead. I want to get um, 2 Peter chapter 3 verses... We're not having good reception. I don't know about you, I'm, I'm getting crap reception. Yeah, I'm getting crap reception too. Has anyone got fast Wi-Fi? I need it. Because um, I'm about to hammer him with some academics on the Greek that he doesn't know about. But I can't do it without bloody Wi-Fi. Um, can, can you just, can you pull up netbible.org for us? Netbible.org and if you go, could go okay. to... Right, go on, bro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So this is 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 5. For there is one God 
Listen carefully. This is the perfect demonstration. There's one God. Let's see who he, who he says this one God is. This is Timothy taught by Paul, correct? Paul was taught by who? Christ himself. Christ himself came to Paul and I was teaching him. So let's see what this person says the one God is. Let's see if it says it's the three persons or if it's one person. 1 Timothy chapter 2 verses 5. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men. The man, Jesus Christ. So is, is the man Jesus Christ the God who he mediates between man? Or is he someone else different from that God who he mediates between? I'll give you another example. Wait, 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 Can wait, wait. Jesus, no, it's the, it's the same thing. Can Jesus be the mediator of someone else for someone else, but be the same person that he's, he's mediating to? Can he do that? Or is that a logical Right, description? can I reply? Go ahead. Right, ladies and gentlemen, while my slow Wi-Fi pulls up the notes that I want to read, I just want to point out to him the Christians don't teach that Jesus Christ is the Father. We're not teaching that Jesus Christ is the mediator to himself. The brother doesn't understand the Trinity. He's arguing against the cartoon characterization of the Trinity. If you're going to argue against a straw man, you're going to lose the debate. Christians do believe that Jesus Christ is fully man. And so, as the second person of the Trinity, who is fully man, priest in the order of Melchizedek, he is our one mediator to the Father. That's one person mediating to another person. That works, ladies and gentlemen. His argument fails. And I've shown you two passages that very clearly, in black and white, say that Jesus is God and Saviour. And he wants to argue that you should take God and apply it to the Father, and you take Saviour and apply it to the Son. But, ladies and gentlemen, that ignores what the word and means. If I say that you are a human and a man, that is different from me saying you are a human and a man, but then saying that the word man refers to someone else. If you say that Jesus Christ is God and Saviour, both of those titles go to Jesus. You can't use the and to talk about someone else that is not in the same clause of the sentence. That is not how language works. No one would say that I am speaking to an ignorant heretic, Shane, that by that statement I meant that Shane was ignorant, but someone else was a heretic. The word heretic and ignorant was both applied to Shane by the word and. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to read from Acts 20, verse 28, and I'm going to ask Shane to answer a simple question. Do you mind if I ask the question first? Who died for the sins of the church? I believe Jesus did. Can you shout it to the back? I believe Jesus did. Did what? He died. He was shed, his blood was shed on the cross. For who? For the sinners of this world. Right, listen. You all heard Shane's good confession. Did you hear Shane's good confession? Yes. yes. Now listen to Acts 20 verse 28. Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock amongst which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. So here's my question to Shane. Who purchased the church with his own blood? Because Acts 28 says God did. So again, and it probably won't be in your translations because this is what English translators do from the Greek from time to time. 
but I can give you relevant manuscripts what, it, what this is in, but they miss out the sun, and I can read it for you. So in Acts uh, 2028, 20, in the... Please say New Living Translation. New, New World Translation. In the contemporary English version, All right. it says, look afterward, after yourself, sorry, and every everyone the Holy Spirit has placed in your care. Be like shepherds to God's church. It is the flock he has brought with the blood of his own son. So in certain translations, it will miss out his own son. In the translation he read, it missed out completely. It just says his own blood. It's actually meant to say his own son's blood. Or in some translations, his son's blood. I can give up many translations that say this. So that one was the contemporary English version. Another one would be the Good News translation. I'll read that one too. So keep watch over yourselves and over the flock which the, which the Holy Spirit has placed in your care. Be shepherds of God, of the Church of God, which He has made. Sorry, which He had, which He made His His own through the blood of His Son. So He made it His own through the blood of His Son. That was the Good News translation, and there's many more, and you can look at the Greek manuscripts that are behind those those translations too. So that's just a translation issue, to be quite fair. Can I can I come back? Go ahead. Yeah. Right, ladies and gentlemen. He quoted two translations that are both paraphrases. Though the, the Good News translation is written for people whose first language is not English. It's not a word-for-word -word translation. And the contemporary English translation is not a word-for-word -word translation. And that's why you should be aware of whether you're quoting a paraphrase or a word-for-word -word translation. I would ask Shane to actually answer the question I asked him. In Acts 20, verse 28, it says that God purchased the church by his blood. He argued, he argued, oh, it depends which translation you read. We will go to the Greek, I have it here, and I will ask him to show me in the Greek which Greek manuscripts say what he said. But I want to return to the issue of 2 Timothy, 2 Titus, verse 13, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to read from Dr. Barterman. Doc, no, sorry, Dr. Daniel Wallace. Dr. Daniel Wallace is a Greek textual scholar. He reads the Greek like you read the English and he's aware of all the textual variants. And on the issue of 2 Titus 13, he says this, the term God and Saviour both refer to the same person, Jesus Christ. This is one of the clearest statements in the New Testament concerning the deity of Christ. The construction in Greek is known as the Granville Sharp Rule named after the English philanthropist, linguist, first clearly articulated the rule in 1798. In what year? 1798. Sharp pointed out that in the construction, the article noun chi, where chi and two nouns are singular, personal and common, i.e. not proper names, they always have the same referent. Illustrations such as the friend and brother, the God and father, etc. abound in the New Testament to prove Sharp's point. So in other words, scholars attest to the fact that 2 Titus 13, both titles, God and Saviour were references to Jesus Christ, not Jesus and the Father, as Shane tried to argue. So now, this is what I mean by New Age scholarship. He just brought out a person called Granville, if I may be saying his name correctly. Granville and, Sharp. And a, and a rule that he came up with in 1780, what was it? I'm 1798. 1798. 
So before 1798, the people that were reading the Greek text didn't have this Greek rule. They didn't have this Greek grammatical rule that he's bringing up. So if this Greek grammatical rule comes into existence in 19, 98, sorry, 1798, please forgive me. You're telling me the Christians before 1798 didn't know how to read um, Titus chapter 1, verse, sorry, Titus chapter 2, verses 13? God forbid, the people before 1789 knew how to read that Greek text without the Granville Sharp rule. How do you think they read it, sir? Do you think they read it with the Granville Sharp rule? Do you want me to answer? You don't have to answer no, it. No, I do. Granville Sharp oh, I really rule. do. No, okay, watch this. Peter didn't have the Granville Sharp rule. How did Peter interpret that text? Simple as. I'll show you how he interpreted that, te that text. I'll give you an example where they make Kai, I've said it in the beginning, the Greek word there is Kai. It shows distinction in person. It shows that the title is not placed upon one person. How do we know this? In John 17 and verses 3, it states, and this is eternal life. This is Jesus speaking. That they may know you, talking to the Father, right? The only true God. And Greek word Kai, Kai in reference to nouns, like he said, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So we've got two people now, and we've got the word Kai, but the Granville Sharp rule don't apply there, does it, sir? Because that would be making Jesus the Father, wouldn't it, sir? Can I reply? So you can reply. Go ahead. Right. So Shane just ignored the evidence. Really didn't. The reality is the Granville Sharp rule testifies to the fact that this kind of construction that you see in uh, 2 Titus uh, 13 is found all over the New Testament. And in all cases, it is translated as having the same referent, like the term God and Father. That is an example of the Granville Sharp Rule. It wasn't, ladies and gentlemen, that people didn't understand this before the Granville Sharp Rule. The Granville Sharp rule was constructed to guide people like Shane, who didn't understand how Greek grammar worked and who were abusing the Greek text and the Greek grammar like Shane has done in this debate. The Granville Sharp rule didn't invent Greek grammar, it describes Greek grammar and it formalized it. Thank you. Why did it formalize it so people like Shane could learn how much they don't know about Greek grammar? It's there to guide people like Shane so that they don't make the mistake that he's made in this debate. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I want to go to the Greek and I have to correct myself. I asked him to show where in Acts 20, verse 28, it says the words, the sun. And actually, both translations are possible. So let me read that to you. At least you can admit that, man. Yeah, but, God, but man. Shane, I've got nothing Thank to hide, God. bro. No, you good, man. You, Doesn't, I've, I've got nothing to hide, bro. Normally when I have that conversation with people, they don't accept it. So I, I give yeah, yeah. that, man. Well, I've got nothing to hide. Because it doesn't contradict my theology. God bless, God bless. Doesn't it doesn't contradict my theology. You're sunk on the Granville uh, Sharp oh, rule, bro. No, you were. <laughs> right. Show me, a, show me a scholar yeah. that that show me a scholar that argues against the Granville Sharp rule. I, no, I'm not even arguing against it. Bro, the fact is, do you that know Gran Greek grammar? I don't know fully. I'm still taking my Greek lessons, right. so I don't know fully. Let, let's but, be clear. Granville Sharp taught Greek grammar. I, I if you went that. to university in 1798. Granville Sharp would be your lecturer. 110%. Thank you. But, but so here you are, I'm a student that doesn't know grammar, okay, trying so to how argue. Many, how many ten? Do you know there's ten rules to the Granville Sharp? Rule? Right. One second. Do you know? Do you yes, know that there are. Rules? Yes. Well, one okay. second. Doctor so, so you, Shane. One second. Okay. Doctor Daniel Wallace is citing the Granville Sharp rule. You can go to Dallas, Texas, the Dallas, Texas Seminary, and go and have this argument with Doctor Daniel Wallace. He will tell you that you are wrong. You're here, a man who is studying Greek grammar, 
doesn't know Greek grammar, isn't a scholar of Greek grammar, and there are two scholars, one that you can talk to today, Dr. Daniel Wallace in Texas, uh, uh, the Seminary of Texas, and they will both tell you that you're wrong. Have some humility, Shane. You don't know as much as you think you do. No problem. I can go to someone like Del Tuggy, who studies Greek grammar and is an expert in Greek grammar, and he understands the same text as I do. So I don't have to go to your Greek grammarians to prove my point. I can go to the Greek grammarians that I have to prove my point. So now watch this. The question I've got to ask for you is what is the primary? Why, what is the primary understanding and how do we come to the conclusion that the Granville Sharp Rule should be articulated in Titus chapter 213? What is the necessity that makes the Granville Sharp Rule there? Do you know? Right, ladies and gentlemen. The necessity is the norms and the functions and the forms of the Greek language. The, the Granville Sharp Rule comes from the text itself. It comes from how those texts, how the Greek constructs a sentence, not just in the New Testament, but outside the New Testament as well. This is equivalent to arguing about some English grammar rule and saying that English grammar rules were invented because they're trying to prove a doctrine. No, they come from how people normally use the language. That's where the Granville Sharp rule comes from. The problem is Shane doesn't want to admit that his argument on Titus 2.13 is sunk by academics. Show me a translation that ascribes the term God to the Father and the term Saviour to the Son. Show me where some translation does that, because they don't. They all ascribe them to the Son. Now, I want to come to Acts 2.28, because Shane made a valid point. But I want to point something out to Shane. Shane made a valid point, and I'm going to demonstrate that the same academic that he is now arguing with agrees with him. But he's going to accept it when the academic agrees with him and argue with him when the academic doesn't. Whereas I'm being consistent. I'm agreeing with the academic when he agrees with me and I'm agreeing with the academic when he agrees with Shane. So ask yourself which one of us is being more consistent. Here's what Dr. Daniel Wallace says about tw Acts 20, verse 28. Or with his own blood, with the blood of his own, the genitive construction could be taken in two ways. As an attributative genitive, second attributative position, meaning his own blood. In other words, God shed his own blood for the church. Or, or as a possessive genitive with the blood of his own son. Now, when Greek grammar works in Shane's favour, he'll be happy to agree with it. When it doesn't work in his favour, he argues that we don't know Greek grammar. But, ladies and gentlemen, either translation of the Greek works with Christian theology. Because if it says God shed his blood for the church, then that means Jesus is God. If it says Jesus the Son shed his blood for the church, well, we believe that Jesus is the Son of the Father and shed his blood for the church. Both of them work within Christian theology, but only one of them works in Shane's theology, not both. So either way, the grammar works for us, but only one way does the grammar work for Shane. So he is driven by ideology to choose one way of interpretation over the other. That's actually incorrect. Both ways translate for us. If you take the genitive in, a pot, in the possessive case or in the other case, because it's talking about what the father done for someone else. That argument's really silly to me, so I won't even give too much time to that. But the Granville Sharp Rule is a good case. I don't disagree with the Granville Sharp Rule. You what literally did. Nope. All I'm saying to you is it was formalized in 1789, 
And then I'm asking you what necessitates it to be in Titus chapter 213, which you haven't given me the parameters and why it's necessary for the Granville Sharp Rule to be in Titus chapter 2, verses 13. You just told me, a scholar says it, so I'm a believer. That's all you've told me. You haven't actually given me the qualifications for the Grand Granville Sharp Rule being there. I did. Now, you didn't listen. I, I, please, sir. Well, I'll say I again. I did. So now, what I'm calling into question is why the Granville Sharp Rule is being implemented there when it doesn't have to be implemented there. Now, let's give another example, right? And I gave one in um, John 17, verses 3, where it says that you, you should believe in the only true God, that's the only true God, that's the Father, and then it says, and Jesus Christ whom he sent. Is the Granville Sharp Rule applied there? I don't know, I'm not a scholar of the right Greek tabs. So there you go, he doesn't know if it's applied there because he's not a, a Greek, Greek scholar, yes. but he wants to appeal to a Greek scholar and say uh, it applies there. Can I reply, so, so, so now I want you, I, what I want you to do is I want you to appeal to the Greek scholar like you did for Titus 2 for verses 13, do it for John 17 verses 3 and then show me the difference between them both because right about now the Greek construction is the same in both scriptures and you said you don't know right so ladies scriptures. and gentlemen ladies and gentlemen let's be clear the fact that I don't know if the Granville Sharp rule isn't applied to 17.3 has no consequence of the fact that it is applied in Titus 2.13 the fact that it is applied in Titus 2.13 isn't in dispute. And the fact is, if the Granville Sharp Rule is applied in Titus 2.13, then both titles of God and Saviour are applied to Jesus, and Shane's argument is sunk. He must demonstrate, Shane must demonstrate, that the, gra the Greek grammar is identical in 17.3, John, to Titus 2.13. Not me because he's using it as a counter argument. And all I have said is I am agnostic as to whether the same rule applies. But 17.3 is a great example of why Jesus is God. Because if you read the whole passage, firstly, the Father glorifies the Son. Did you all hear that? The Father glorifies the Son. He lit. The Father worships the Son, in other words. And in 17.3, Jesus says that the Father is the only true God. We Christians believe that, no problem. But in 17.5 of John, Jesus said, Now glorify me with the glory that I had with you before the foundations of the world. So in other words, Jesus is claiming divine glory and pre-existence before the world was. Yeah. How can that be anything other than divine? Correct. To have divine glory before creation itself. In other words, he went to the wrong passage. The passage supports Jesus' divinity, not the fact that Jesus isn't divine. And Shane consistently fails to see two points. I'll remind him of both. We Christians believe that Jesus is a man. So just pointing out that Jesus is a man doesn't disprove that he is also God. And secondly, Christians believe that the Son is not the Father. So pointing out that the Son is not the Father doesn't disprove our belief. Shane is trying to argue against doctrines I don't hold whilst ignoring the doctrines that I claim. Now let me ask Shane a question. If Jesus is not God, why does he have divine glory before the world was? Because it was promised to him according to Ephesians chapter 1 and I can read it. Ephesians chapter 1 verses 5 I'm going to read from verses 3 it says blessed be 
the God and Father, no, it is Kai, and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ Jesus with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Were we there before the foundation of the world? How can God choose us before the foundation of the world if we wasn't there before the foundation of the world? We would have had to be been there for him to choose us before the foundation of the world. Pretty simple. So just because the scripture says that a person was there before the foundation of the world doesn't mean that they're God because we have been chosen before the foundation of the world as human beings in Christ Jesus. Now a second point that he made is that Jesus has divine glory. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, it tells us the believers in Jesus, me, him, everyone else who believes in Jesus and the Father, truly and wholly, guess what it says? That we will share that same glory. It will, in, in, let me get that as well. Let me just read it. In, no, one verse at a time, we, okay, one okay, passage. one verse at a time. So, so now my next question for him, I will read the verse later is, Jesus has that glory, yes, and that is divine glory, 110%, because there's only one glory that the Most High gives to every being on this earth, and guess what? We share it too, do we not? Right, we shall don't, I reply? Yeah, go ahead. Right, right, ladies and gentlemen, he has accepted that Jesus had divine glory. Thank you. But Jesus said that he had it before the foundation of the world. Now, his counter-argument was to appeal to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5, where we are chosen by God before the foundation of the world. Did you hear the difference? One is about what you possess before the foundation of the world, meaning you exist before the foundation of the world, and the other is predicated on God's eternal knowledge, God's infinite knowledge, and that God chooses you before the foundation of the world. So he's right to point out that those who are chosen before the foundation of the world did not exist because God chose them before they existed to be the elect. That's what Christians believe. But Jesus didn't claim to be promised something to be before the foundation of the world. Jesus isn't the one that receives it in Ephesians chapter 1. He claims to possess it in John 17, 5. Glorify me now, Father, with the glory that I had with you before the foundations of the world. So he compared apples to oranges. And he did so because he's having to bend scripture to fall in with doctrines that are not scriptural. Furthermore, in the Gospel of John, this is my passage, that Thomas says to Jesus in black and white, and the Greek is unambiguous, the statement is pros towards Jesus, my Lord and my God. No, prostontheon is John chapter 1. Thomas, Thomas says, even helping you with the Greek there, bro. <laughs> Thomas says, pros to Jesus, my Lord and my God in black and white. So Jesus is proclaimed as Lord and God by Thomas, and no, I don't know if the Granville Sharp rule applies to the words, my Lord and my God, before you ask shame. But the fact of the matter is, both statements are directed to Jesus, and that's not just my opinion, that is the, the opinion of Dr. James White, that is the opinion of Dr. Daniel Wallace, that is the opinion of Dr. Bart Metzger ladies and gentlemen, who are all far more competent in Greek than Shane or myself. So the plain rebuttal to John chapter 20, 28 is very simple. Yes, it's towards Jesus. It says, my Lord and my God, but that doesn't mean he's calling Jesus his Lord and his God. For an example, I'll give you an example and I'll read scripture to back it up. 
If I said to you, sir, if I said to you, today you're going to meet someone and he's going to tell you something that's going to happen in your future. I, just, I said it to you now. You go 20 minutes down the road and you meet that person and he says, yeah, this is going to happen in your future. You're going to be like, my Lord and my God. You're going to, let's say you come back in, you see me and you say, my Lord and my God, what you said was true. Does that mean you're calling me your Lord and your God? No. That means you're exclaiming Lord and God because of what I said to you and the thing that happened over there previously. Now let's prove it. Now let's prove it in scripture. Remember, in John 20, 28, Thomas is saying this. In John 14, Thomas questions Jesus. Now we gotta read this very carefully because people miss it. John 14, verses 8. No, I'm gonna read from verses 5. It says, Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? Where is he where he's going? Where's the way? Look where it says. It says, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. If, if you have seen me, Jesus is saying, if you have seen me, guess what? You have seen the Father also. Henceforth, you know him, meaning you've known the Father, and have seen him meaning you have seen the father so when you see jesus according to what he's told well, thomas is when you see me question. you see the father that's what he said you know that you know me you know the father bro we, we were having said. a debate right now look we're having a debate sir sorry we take we're having a debate so look a q a has what? to be agreed by both of us yeah, yeah. so there's only yeah, where was god the father then five minutes and we are you saying yeah, that yeah the just god just keep going just keep going so this is verse seven sorry verses eight Philip That's said ludicrous. to him, Lord, lie. show us the Father and we God. shall be Jesus. we shall be satisfied. That's Jesus That's said lie. to them, have Jesus I been with you so God. long? And yet, do you not know me, Philip? He who has That's seen me has seen the Father. He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am the Father? Sorry, I am in the, the Father, Father and the Father, and the Father, is, Father in is in me. The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his work. So this is about how through Jesus you see the one You have introduced two verses. Well, it's, it's the same you, track. You, you, you have to get fair the enough, concept. Fair enough, fair enough. Right, Can I, when you're ready, I'll reply. So notice what it says in the last verse that I just read. It says, do you not believe? Listen to it. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak of my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. So the thing they don't believe is the works and that the Father is in him and that you can see the Father through him. That's what they don't believe at this point. This is why when you go to John 20, remember you was talking to Thomas. When you go to John 20 and 28, he says, my Lord and my God, because now he believes what Jesus said. He believes that when he sees Jesus, he sees the Father. How? Because they didn't believe. Remember, he says, do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? If you don't believe, believe because of the word. Can I reply? Because of the words. John 8. 29. Wait, wait, bro, you're just got, John, you're, you're just John introducing 20, more and more verses. Bro, I'm reading we the context. We said one passage at a time. You don't want me to read the context. One passage at a time, 110%. But I have to read the context <laughs> to answer your question. I have to. Go on, so keep is, going, keep going, so keep going. So this is John 20, 28 and 29. The verse is in question. Now, I've already said it's towards Jesus. It's an exclamatory claim because he's marveled at what has happened and how he's seeing the Father through Jesus. How is he doing this? Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? In John 14, what was Thomas meant to see? I'm asking you. Wait, 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 bro, 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 bro. He was bro. meant to see the Father, Bro, right? bro, bro, if you're going to debate him, I'm just going to go on. Him. I'm not debating Right, well, don't get involved. Don't bring in, don't, no, bro, don't get so involved can, in a so debate. everyone can see bro, the context. Bro, if you, I'm, okay, no problem, don't I won't. involve no people. Problem, I won't. Don't no involve problem. people. No, you're debating me, no not him. No problem, I won't. You ask so, a question no, to me in No problem, I won't. Every time I ask you a question, it seems like you don't answer it. That's why. So, again, I'm going to just do this again. In John 14, I won't read it. John 14. Verses 10, it literally tells you, if you've seen me, you see the Father. If you, you don't believe you see the Father, believe because of the works. Now what does he say in John 20, 28, 29? He says, 
he says. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? What does it mean to see Jesus? Can I reply now? It means now? to see the Father. Can Go I ahead. reply? Right, so ladies and gentlemen, yeah. I want to point out that nothing that Shane said contradicts what I believe. Why doesn't it contradict what I believe? Why? I'll tell you why. It says this in Hebrews chapter 1. God, yes, that's allowed in the deep terms of the debate. Not, I can introduce. Yes, I can. Context. Oh, wait. That's so he, con he, can, he can. He can. He introduced. Bro, why are you complaining, Shane? You, he knows he's in trouble. No, he knows he's in trouble. He knows he's in trouble. He knows he's. We did one passage for one passage. You've done that to me. Bro, bro, Shane, 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 I ask Shane. I introduced Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. You jumped to Matthew 14 to try and explain it. I am now going to respond. Shane, I'm now going to respond. Shane, I am now going. Shane, I am now going. Shane, I am now going to respond. Shane, I am now going to respond. Shane, I am now going to respond. Shane, let me respond. Calm yourself down. Calm. Shane, you've been, really well. Shane you've been doing really well. Shane, you've been doing really well. Calm down, Shane. Calm down, Shane. Calm down, Shane. I am going to respond. Shane, I am going to respond. Shane, are you done? Can I respond, Shane? Shane, can I respond? Shane, can I respond? Shane, can I respond? Thank you. Right. So, so. Nothing of what he said contradicts what we believe. Why, Bob? G he accepts that J James, he accepts that Thomas does say to Jesus, my Lord and my God. And he tries to get around it by saying that Thomas was a blasphemer. That he would just go, my Lord and my God, in the same way that people in the way that people Shane's interrupting calm down Shane Shane you're rattled Shane Shane you're rattled Shane Shane you're rattled Shane Shane you're rattled Shane let me finish Shane let me finish Shane Shane let me finish Shane let me finish Shane let me finish Shane let me finish let me finish Shane let me finish reply Shane, let me finish. Shane, let me finish. Shane, let me finish. I could get very loud to you. I could get Shane, let me finish. I did not call Shane, let me finish. Shane, let me finish. That's all I'm asking. Shane, let me finish. 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 Let me finish, Shane. 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 Now, the reason why Shane is rattled is because he knows he's about to be busted. And, ladies and gentlemen, if I interrupt Shane, if I interrupt Shane, he will complain. But if he continues to interrupt me, I will be interrupting him when he speaks next. And watch as he complains about the interruption. Now, ladies and gentlemen, he tried to argue that Thomas made an exclamation. Let me explain why it was blasphemy. Because in Hebrew culture, the name of God was sacred. The name of God is something precious. In the Gospel of Matthew, such was the protection of God, the term God, Matthew wouldn't even put God. He replaces it with heaven as a respect to his Jewish audience. So they wouldn't even say God like that. So the idea that Thomas would say, my Lord and my God, as an exclamation of surprise, 
is to put blasphemy into the mouth of Thomas. The commandments say that you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. That means you don't use references to God in flippant ways. In the Hebrew text, they wouldn't even write the name of God because it was so precious to them. And yet Shane is trying to suggest that Thomas just said in exclamation, my Lord and my God, to Jesus. That's why it's blasphemy. I didn't lie. Shane just doesn't know the culture. Now, furthermore, ladies and gentlemen, furthermore, ladies and gentlemen, I am now going to interrupt Shane when he speaks next. And I want you all to remember when he complains how he is behaving right now. Now, furthermore, ladies and gentlemen, the reference in John chapter 14, where Jesus said, he who has seen me has seen the Father, agrees completely with what Christians believe. This is why it says in Hebrews chapter 1, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his son whom he appointed heir of all things through whom he made the world think about that the scripture says that god the father made the world through jesus christ doesn't that imply that jesus was there before the foundation of the world doesn't that agree with John 17, 5? It goes on. And he is the exact radiance of his glory, the exact representation of his nature. The word exact representation means icon. And the word nature is a reference to the substance of the Father. In other words, to the thing that makes the Father the Father. The Son is the exact representation of it, identical to it, the exact image of the Father. So when Jesus says, he who has seen me has seen the Father, he means this, that if you see the Son, you see exactly who the Father is because the Son is identical to the Father and does the works of the Father. Put your hand up if as a created being you believe that you can do the works of God. Put your hand up. One person thinks you can. Two people think you can. Let's be clear. The Son is doing the works of the Father because he is divine. This connects to the idea of theosis. This idea that by our acceptance of the Son, we are divinized. We are made like God. And so those that put their hand up are not wrong in believing that they can do the works of God. Because when you heal, that is God's power working through you. When you prophesy, that is God's power working through you. But Jesus is claiming something more than that. He is claiming to be the one who resurrects the dead. Who believes that you can resurrect the dead? You two who put your hand up. Do you believe you can resurrect the dead? Do you believe that you can resurrect the dead? No, he does not. But Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. I give life to whom I choose. And that is why the Son is doing the works of the Father. That is why the Son shares in the glory of the Father. That is why he is the exact image of the Father. That is why when you look upon the Son, 
you look upon the Father. And that is why Thomas said, my Lord and my God, not as some flippant comment, but because he believed that Jesus was his Lord and his God. Your turn. And I am going to interrupt you. So the first thing I want to do is forget about Hebrews 1 because it had nothing to do with our conversation. Yes, it does. It's to do with the icon, the image of it God. It has nothing to do with John chapter 14. Yes, or it does. Because it's the same so, theological doctrine. He wants to pay evil with evil, apparently. You know, Just I trying to teach him manners, Shane. So I interrupted him. Just trying to teach him manners. Notice so, he's complaining. I'm really not complaining. Notice he's complaining. He, he said, he said what Notice he's complaining. No, no, because Hebrews has nothing to do with John. It's the same 15, theological theme. It's the th it thank you. No, it yes, it's the, context, it's the Bible, John which is our authority. And John 20. Do you not? Do you like being interrupted, Shane? Do you like being interrupted, Shane? So shall we go back to not interrupting no, one no, another? No, you interrupt. Right. Still. So we'll just John, go interrupt. John, we'll just go interrupt. Because the reason why is because John 14 and John 20. You can, you can continue interrupting. I will. I will. Okay. At leisure. So John 14 and John 20. You know, it says that you have to believe in something uh, yes. correct what we're talking about and what do and we believe the belief that he who is sees he the father is, who sees the, is father, the one who sees the, the son and correct, in hebrews right? it says that, that jesus is the exact is image the of the father, father. And that's the exact image about. of the Father. In chapter, in so John there chapter, is in why John 20, 20 is, no is linked to Hebrews chapter 1. one. There's no connection. Because it doesn't work to quote Hebrews chapter 1. It proves. Because he knows that Hebrews chapter 1 works and demonstrates that John chapter 1 should be interpreted from a Trinitarian perspective. I'm trying to tell you. And, and the reason why like I was trying to tell them and the people you interrupted yeah, and me. You lied on me. No, I didn't. That's, you did. You I told, explained. You just, you just Deal said, with the argument, said, not the man. You said that Deal I said with the argument, not the man. You said so that I, you and I demonstrated said, why and it's you, a blasphemy. And you lied. And I demonstrated. And you lied, I no, I gave that. an argument. I never what was the argument, you Shane? Lied what was the argument? What was the argument? What was the argument? Listen, what was the argument? You lied what was the you argument? Said, you said what was the Trump? argument? I never said what was the that's argument? It. What was the argument? You, you what was the argument? And you're upset. What was the argument? And that's why what was the argument? No, I'm, in, I'm upset because you interrupted me. Yeah, because you lied. I in, I'm upset because you interrupted me. Shall we go back to a calm conversation? Shall we go back to a calm Or shall we just stop here? Let me tell you something. Then let's stop. Let's stop. Have a good day. I'm going to stop. You're not a righteous person. I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop. Because when you lied on me, you said, I'm going to stop. The conversation is broken down. That's fine. I've offered That's to fine. you, That's I've offered fine. to That's you fine. a return to a peaceful That's conversation. That's fine. You've refused I, that, I, I refuse so now that. I'm just going to stop the conversation. No Nobody lied upon and, you. And I want you. The I want statement you to, I want that you made is to put blasphemy want, into the mouth of to, Thomas. I want you to have a conversation. I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop this conversation. I'm going to stop this conversation. No, I'm going to stop. Shane, have a good day. Have a good day. Take care. Right. So, ladies and gentlemen. So, ladies and gentlemen. Right, who's got these mics? I'm not gonna. I mean, if you're gonna do that, I'm just not gonna well, talk to you. Don't lie on people next time. Didn't lie. Don't say someone I said demonstrated when they why your say arguments you were blasphemy. I demonstrated why your arguments were blasphemy. There's a difference between demonstrating and then saying someone said something. Why your arguments were blasphemy into something. Thomas's it's mouth. Two different things. Shane, you there's did it. Own it. You did it. Own it. You did it. You're on it. Have a good day, Shane. You take care. Right, ladies and gentlemen, any questions? I, I like talking. Go on, bro. Okay, so the question is can you be a non Trinitarian like Shane and be a Christian? The answer to that question is no. It's impossible to be a Christian and not believe in the Trinity. I demonstrated to Shane where the scriptures clearly state that Jesus is God, in black and white. I demonstrated that those verses were backed up by the interpretation of academics of the Greek grammar. I demonstrated, and I was even willing to concede 
when Shane made a valid point. But the problem with Shane is that he was a little overexcited and he didn't accept the fact that his, his defence of Thomas's words is to put blasphemy into Thomas's mouth. And he just took his chucks, toys out of the pram. A Christian, by definition, glorifies Father, Son and Holy Spirit. To deny Father, Son and Holy Spirit means that you are not a Christian.